Well, it's good to see everyone here again, as always. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you here. Come back and uh, be with us anytime that you can. Revelation chapter 2 is our text this evening. Brother Dickey is reminding me on the way up here this evening that I've got a lot to do because I made a promise that we would get through the other six letters to the church. That's probably not going to happen, but it was a nice idea. <clears throat> we'll start with uh, chapter 2 and verse 8, the message to the church at Smyrna. Before we do that, however, um, there is a pattern to these letters, and they do seem to fall in kind of a inverse parallel kind of situation. We have Ephesus as the first letter, and remember that uh, the Lord said that uh, they had left their first love, told them to remember from where they had fallen, or else I will come and remove your lampstand out of its place. And then kind of at the other bookend is the letter to Laodicea, where the Lord says that you're neither hot nor cold, and so I will spit you out of my mouth, and they too have got a, a serious problem among them, and the Lord tells them to repent as well. So we have at the first and the last of the list two churches that are in danger of losing their identity. They are in situations where things have gotten fairly critical from the Lord's point of view, and they need to fix something that uh, is at the core of who they are. Each one of those... Uh, is then kind of bookended in turn by a church where there is a lot of good things going on. So in contrast to the church that is on the edge of losing its identity, then comes Smyrna, a church where there is faithfulness and loyalty, and Philadelphia uh, is like that as well. And then in the middle, we have three churches, Pergamum, Thyatira, and Sardis, that are all guilty of some kind of compromise it does not seem to have been the kind of compromise that has gotten to a critical situation yet. It seems to be the kind of thing that the Lord is saying, here's something that concerns me. You need to do something about this before it gets worse. You know about it. Some people have complained about it and stood against it, but not enough. And so those three letters in the middle represent churches that are somewhere between faithful and loyal and on the edge of losing their identity and as we go from Pergamum to Thyatira to Sardis, we have these three that uh, Pergamum is probably in the better situation, Sardis in the worst, uh, sustaining the worst kind of compromise. So that kind of pattern has been noted, and we might want to keep that in mind as we look at some of these letters uh, throughout the text. So chapter 2 and verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. A couple things that we know about Smyrna that may help us to appreciate what the Lord says to the church. They were a wealthy city. Uh, they are located right on the Aegean Sea, uh, what is now the western coast of Turkey, and they had two ports, so ships could uh, get in uh, to Smyrna and easily unload their wares at either port. And of course, port cities tend to be wealthy cities because there's a lot of goods coming in and out. It's a place of exchange, buying and selling, uh, transportation going inland and coming toward the sea. So all kinds of businesses would have supported the ports. Uh, the population, I've seen various estimates about the population in the literature. Some have placed the uh, population... Uh, uh, approximation at 100,000, some at about 200,000. But either way, it was a good-sized city by ancient standards. Uh, one of the biggest cities outside of Rome had about 300,000 people in it in the ancient world. So anything uh, over 100,000 people would have been a candidate for a big city. And it was probably uh, the one of the closest rivals to the city of Ephesus 
in terms of trade and reputation for being kind of one of those jewel cities of Asia Minor. There was also, uh, as we have noted before and will continue to notice, a presence of the emperor called in this city. And as we're going to notice, several of these cities that John, uh, that the Lord writes to were homes to emperor cult institutions and installations. Uh, Smyrna had a long history of being loyal to Rome in some of the conflicts that had erupted in Asia Minor while Rome was arising to power, Smyrna had always sided with the Romans. They had figured out that it was probably going to be expedient to do so, and so uh, they had always been a good friend of Rome. Since the second century BC, they had had a temple to Rome. Uh, it was a temple that venerated Rome as kind of a uh, thing worthy of the, the worship of a god. Sometimes Rome is deified as a woman, the goddess Roma, uh, and uh, so she would have been worshipped here uh, as kind of a gesture of loyalty to Rome. And this city was destroyed in the 7th century B.C. in uh, some of the wars that had gone on way back then. The Lydians had conquered and destroyed the city. And then Alexander the Great decided that the city needed to be rebuilt. He rebuilt it at a different spot than its original spot, but by New Testament times it was this thriving city that we've just seen. And that's kind of interesting because the Lord describes himself in similar terms in chapter 2 and verse 8. He was dead and has come to life. And so the people of Smyrna perhaps would have understood the significance of that uh, in a special kind of way, that this is a Lord who cannot be defeated, just like their own city had proven to be resilient. Uh, there's not much to see of uh, the Roman Smyrna. This is uh, pretty much the, the big thing to see. If you go downtown to Smyrna, Right in the middle of downtown, where all these tall buildings and apartments are and everything, there's an area of about a city block where they have this. And there's not really much else to see other than that. This is part of what was the ancient marketplace. And uh, you can see in the foreground here, uh, this would have been originally covered over with uh, like a marble pavement or a limestone pavement. And this is the underground level of the shopping area and uh, the columns would have stood all the way around it, a typical Roman forum. But to give you an idea of uh, maybe something of what something looks like there. Uh, now, the Lord says, I know your tribulation and the blasphemy by those who say that they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. In all of these letters, there are lots of things mentioned that it would be nice if we could ask John a question, just exactly what was the problem? What were they doing? What was going on? And as we see later in Pergamum and Thyatira, there are some people mentioned that we would probably like to know more about. But we're kind of left with just this bare kind of outline. John says that there is a synagogue of Satan among you. We don't really know what the Jews in this part of the world we're doing with Christians. Uh, the only really clear picture that we have of Jewish attitudes toward Christians are places like Palestine and Rome. But in other parts of the emperor like, uh, empire like Asia Minor, we really don't have a, a very good picture of these groups. There is in a biography of Domitian this interesting statement, though. This is the Roman historian Suetonius writing about the life of the emperor Domitian. And remember, Domitian is the emperor at the time John writes this. There was a cash crunch in Domitian's day, kind of like there is in our country right now. The economy had gone bad. And to keep the government afloat, Domitian was trying to get money from every source that he could. He was enforcing taxes that hadn't been enforced very well, raising new taxes, things like that. And so Suetonius is talking about uh, his attempt here to get money for the imperial treasury. He says, reduced to financial straits, besides other taxes, that on the Jews was levied with the utmost rigor. Now let's just stop right there. In the year 70 AD, and everybody knows what happened in 70 AD, big event, 
destruction of Jerusalem. Well, not only did the temple get destroyed, but the Romans invented a new tax that year, the Jewish tax. And if you were a Jew, you had to pay a special tax for being a Jew, and the money went to build a temple to a pagan god in Rome as insult on top of injury. This is the tax that this historian is talking about, the tax on the Jews. So he's trying to collect all the Jewish tax he can get his hands on. Those were prosecuted who, without publicly acknowledging that faith, lived as Jews, as well as those who concealed their origin and did not pay the tribute levied upon their people. Now, this latter group of people, those who concealed their origin, are probably Jews who are trying to blend in with the rest of society so they don't have to pay the special tax. They probably couldn't afford to pay it, and they figure, well, if I don't dress like a Jew, if I don't take off work on the Sabbath day, nobody will know, don't have to pay the tax. It's this other group of people that are interesting, people who, without publicly acknowledging that faith, lived as Jews. Here are people who are practicing Judaism, at least enough to, for people to think that they are Jews, but they don't publicly acknowledge that faith. And most historians believe that those are Christians. Christians who were trying to hide out in synagogues, as it were, who were laying low to avoid trouble and trying to blend in with Jews and these were no doubt Jewish Christians trying to kind of uh, to do that, or maybe even Gentiles who were just trying to say, well, I'm just a Jew, and uh, you know, that, let that be that. Suetonius doesn't tell us the name of these people, but it is tempting to think that these are Christians. And the, 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 the statement there kind of gives us an indication of how hard it must have been for these Christians to find a place in the society, and to escape notice. And so when John says that there is a synagogue of Satan, uh, we can kind of get a little glimpse here of, of how hard it was for these Christians. There's another text, though. This is a, a, a text called The Martyrdom of Polycarp. Polycarp, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, was a Christian in the early 2nd century. He died in the year 155 AD and was executed at the city of uh, Smyrna. This is the account of his death. It goes on for several chapters, but notice this account. While he spoke these and many other things, Polycarp was talking about his faith as they were uh, getting ready to burn him at the stake. It says he was filled with confidence and joy and his countenance was full of grace so that the proconsul, the, go the government official there, was astonished and he sent his herald to proclaim in the midst of the stadium three times Polycarp has confessed that he is a Christian. Now, immediately that tells you that this is the charge against him. He's a Christian and he has admitted it. This proclamation having been made by the herald, the whole multitude, both of the heathen and Jews who dwelt at Smyrna, cried out with uncontrollable fury and a loud voice. It is obvious that the Jews are glad that Polycarp is going to be executed. The, uh, the statement was, this is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the overthrower of our gods, he who has been teaching many not to sacrifice or to worship the gods. So that little statement in this bigger account gives you a sense of the hostility that was directed against Christians, not only by pagans, but also by Jews. Other than that, it's hard to say exactly what these Jews were doing to Christians, but uh, the Lord says, I know that it's tough on you, and I know what you're going through. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Um, the devil is going to test you, but I uh, will give you the crown of life. Um, I think we'll come back to testing in a moment, maybe. Um, <clears throat> Here it is, imprisonment. He, you, some of you are about to be thrown into prison, he says. Now, we look at that and we say, well, I understand what that is, right? Get thrown in jail because you're a lawbreaker. 
but not in the Roman world. In the Roman world, imprisonment was not a long-term punishment. In the Roman world, there were only three reasons why you would be thrown in jail. To get you to confess that you had done something wrong, to coerce you to, you know, cooperate with the charges, to hold you while you were waiting trial, and trials were very speedy in the ancient world unless, you know, somebody wanted to make you just sit in jail and rot, uh, and thirdly, to hold you before your execution. But, you know, spending 25 years in jail didn't happen in the ancient world. So when the Lord says that you're, some of you are about to be cast into prison, it doesn't mean you're going to be spending the rest of your lives there. It means you're either going to be tortured or executed. That's what we should understand by that. What Some of you are about to suffer, the Lord says, and as we just mentioned, Polycarp in the middle of the second century dies in Smyrna for his faith. And interestingly enough, Polycarp was personally acquainted with the Apostle John. So you can see from what evidence that we do have left how the Lord's words certainly came true. You'll have tribulation for 10 days. 10 days is undoubtedly symbolic that for a, a, a complete period of time, a complete testing is in view here. But if you'll be faithful, I'll give you the crown of life. Crowns are an interesting thing in the ancient world. Uh, and exactly what this crown of life would have meant to these people has been debated. Uh, there are certain images that would have come to mind. Uh, first of all, the Acropolis of a city. Many of you are familiar with the fact that in the ancient world, that the city was built on two places. You would have kind of a, the regular area and then a high place or an Acropolis, and that's where the most important temples and the religious precincts were up there. And if you were doing your shopping down in the lower part of the city, you could always look up and see up on the hill the city built up there with its shining marble buildings looking like a crown. So some have suggested that that would have first come to mind. Uh, others have suggested imperial crowns, the kind of crown that Caesar wore or the kind of crown that an imperial priest would have worn. Or some have suggested that maybe crowns on a more... Uh, common basis, crowns as signs of special honor and status for people who had done significant things. For example, let's say that you are a wealthy businessman living in Smyrna. Wealthy people were expected to help do things to make the city nicer, and so it might be that you pay to have a sidewalk put in, or you pay to have columns put up around the marketplace or something like that. And if you did that, they would normally make a statue of you, put it somewhere out in public, and the statue would depict you as wearing a crown to indicate that you were honored above other people. Uh, this is the Acropolis of Smyrna. The hill back here you see is Mount Pegasus, and in ancient times the uh, temples and stuff would have been viewable back there. So some have suggested that that might be the image that Jesus is saying, that I will lift you up on high, that I will make you obviously uh, glorious, that kind of sense. Uh, this is in the Smyrna Museum. This statue, which has been damaged, uh, is of an imperial <coughs> priest. That is to say he was the priest in the emperor cult, and uh, this is much later under an emperor called Septimius Severus, several years after the New Testament period, but uh, his name is Flavius Damianus, and you can see very clearly the crown that he wears on his head. And so some have suggested that Jesus is saying, well, those that are going to be your enemies, they wear crowns, but in return for your faithfulness, I'll give you a better crown to wear. And then uh, others have suggested that maybe it is more on the popular level. <laughs> In the Roman world, crowns would indicate, as we said, honor or status, victory or achievement. Maybe if you had uh, won an athletic contest or done something of special note, uh, sometimes you would wear uh, a crown at a special occasion, maybe the emperor's birthday, or maybe the celebration of the founding day of the city, or something like that. Uh, crowns could also be a symbol of captivity. 
Sometimes slaves had bands put about their heads to mark them as slaves. Uh, and perhaps even more commonly, crowns were always depicted on the statues of the gods or people and animals associated with the gods. So exactly what this crown of life is supposed to convey, you know, is maybe not crystal clear to us. But it seems clear enough that the idea is that the Lord is going to acknowledge their greatness because of their faith, that he is going to give them a reward that proclaims their honor in his sight, uh, whichever of these uh, kinds of uh, images you want to use for that. Uh, any other uh, observations that you have? Those are just a few things about uh, Smyrna here. Any observations, questions, comments you all right, then let's look at Pergamum, uh, verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name. Before we get into that text, uh, Pergamum was also designated as the official imperial temple site for, for a total of three times in the ancient world. By New Testament times, it had had that honor twice, it was going to get it one more time after New Testament times. So you can see that these cities are kind of in competition. Ephesus claimed this honor. Smyrna claimed this honor. Pergamum claimed this honor. They're vying for who can show their loyalty to the Romans. And you live in a city like this, that's a big deal. And so the Lord says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And again, there is... A lot of questions we could ask about that. Just exactly what was this? And there have been at least four serious um, contenders for this. One might be the emperor cult, that this is John's way of referring to the worship of the Roman emperor, that it's the throne of Satan, because the emperors use divine titles blasphemously, and that would be kind of a, a perversion, or not kind of a perversion, but a perversion of what was right. It would be satanic, as we'll see later on in chapter 13. Others have suggested, though, that there was a particular spot in the city of Pergamum that John had in mind, and that was the altar of Zeus. We'll look at that in just a moment, but it's a large kind of U-shaped altar that some have suggested may have suggested the idea of a throne for a god or a throne of Satan. There was also an installation of the cult of Asclepius in the city of Pergamum. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But its symbol is a serpent. And we know later on in the book of Revelation that the serpent and Satan are identified. So some have suggested that because of the serpent cult here, that that would have been the throne of Satan. And others have suggested that it's maybe just the way the city looked. I'll show you a photograph here uh, in just a moment of what the city looks like. Some have suggested that it, the city kind of looked like a big throne that had been carved out of a mountain. So this is uh, the uh, emperor that was built, or the temple that was built to the emperor Trajan, uh, or what's left of it, standing there in the city of Pergamum. This was built in the second century. Uh, Trajan was one of the early emperors of the second century. So after the book of Revelation, this emperor cult still thrived, and some have suggested that this might have been Satan's throne, this installation. Uh, this is one of the inscriptions that is still there at Pergamum, and uh, if I have any Greek students in the room, see if you can read this. This word here, autor, autocrator, is the word that is used of God in the Bible, almighty. So the emperor here is being referred to as Almighty. Here he is called the son of the god Nerva. Nerva was his father who is now being called divine. Trajan is the son of God. These two lines say that he is the Lord of the earth and of the sea. And you can see how this language would have been offensive to a Christian, that that's blasphemous to call the emperor the Almighty, the Son of God, the Lord of, of earth and sea, that Jesus is all of those things. 
And so because of the way that the emperor is described in the emperor cult, some have suggested that that's Satan's throne. Others have suggested that this is Satan's throne. This is the second possibility. This is in the Berlin Museum, correct? Berlin? I've not been there to see it, but hopefully someday I'll get there. But this is the reconstruction of the great altar of Zeus at Pergamum, and you can see that uh, it has been suggested that it might look like a throne-shaped kind of thing. This is the spot in the city of Pergamum where that altar originally stood, sitting out on the hill, and if you could see it from a distance, it may have looked like the throne. Being associated with Zeus, some have suggested that that maybe is the idea. The third possibility, we said, was having to do with Asclepius. Asclepius was the Greek god of healing. And you'll notice the symbol that Asclepius is holding there in his uh, hand is this staff with the serpent going around it uh, that we see in the uh, drawing there. The serpent, of course, snakes shed their skins. They renew themselves. The old is put off and they become young again. And so the serpent is associated with Asclepius for that sense of healing and renewing that the serpent represented. And there were several places in the ancient world where there was a place called an Asclepion, kind of a hospital, uh, as it were. What you would do is you would go to this place and spend the night there. And when you got up the next morning, you were supposed to tell one of the priests here what you dreamed last night. They would then interpret that dream to make, it un to make you understand that, well, that means you're going to be okay. It's kind of a psychosomatic, psychological thing you went to. And you could go and sit in the warm baths for a couple of days, and they would give you, you know, things to eat that they told you was going to make you feel better. And uh, you would leave probably thinking that you were better, and uh, these were considered, uh, you know, important places. So because of the serpent, some have suggested that that's what Satan's throne was. Uh, but then maybe the city itself. Here's a view of the Acropolis, a little better view there. You can see the great uh, theater here where the temples and other things stood. Just kind of looking at it, it looks like a big, maybe, seat carved out of a mountain. So exactly what the throne of Satan was, nobody knows for sure, but those are some of the possibilities. Um, whatever it was that they were facing, it is some symbol of opposition here, that something that's causing trouble for the Christians. And the Lord says that you are holding fast to my name, you haven't denied my faith, even in the days of Antimus, my faithful witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you. This is the only church that we actually read of where people are actually being persecuted. Now at Smyrna, the Lord said, you're about to be persecuted. At Pergamum, it's already happening, and one of them has been killed. So that's an interesting kind of uh, situation. Why he died, we don't know. Did he get himself in trouble with the emperor cult or something? It would be nice to know, but we don't. But whatever it is, the, the conflict has already started. Now the Lord says, you've been good and faithful, but I do have something against you. Verse 14, there are some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. Now, of course, we know Balaam from Numbers 22. That as the Israelites are conquering Transjordan, Balak hires this false prophet Balaam to curse the Israelites so that they won't be able to uh, be uh, victorious. Uh, somebody please go to 2 Peter 2 and verse 15, if you would, and read that for us. See what Peter says about it. <clears throat> Forsaking the right way, they went astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the hire of wrong Forsaking the right way and loving the hire of wrongdoing. Um, there's a couple little pieces in the puzzle here to put together. Somebody go to Numbers 31 and read for us verse 16. Another piece of the puzzle here. Somebody else please go to uh, Numbers 25.2. Have that ready. And somebody else go to Psalm 106, 28 and 29. Who's got Numbers 31.16? can read it. 
Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of the Lord. There was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Okay, the fornication that the Israelites engage in at Baal Peor that gets God angry at them, according to Numbers 31, it is Balaam who puts that idea in their head. So there is an association with Balaam and the fornication of God's people with these pagans. Who's got Numbers 25-2? can read that for us. Anybody? Numbers 25-2, yeah. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Okay, we've got bowing down to their gods in Numbers 25, and who's got Psalm 106, 28, and 29? Go ahead, Joseph. They joined themselves to Baal Peor, and they sacrificed to the dead. Thus they provoked him to angels with their knees, and they broke the house of my mother. Ah, an interesting, interesting notice there that it says in Numbers 25, as they are at Baal Peor, that they bowed down to their gods. And in Psalm 106, 28 and 29, they made sacrifices to the dead. <clears throat> now we look at that and we say, how can that be? The gods and the dead are two different things. Well, maybe not. The word that is used here in Revelation chapter 2, where it says <clears throat> that he put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols. Things sacrificed to idols. That's the very same word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10, Acts 15, and later on in Acts 21. This whole issue of eating meat sacrificed to idols. And without going into a kind of a, a long digression, what it turns out is that this word that you see on the screen there may very well refer to sacrifices in honor of the dead who are being honored as gods. There were several Roman feasts. One of them was called the Parentalia or the Feralia, in which you would go to the cemetery and you would offer sacrifices to the dead people in your family that had gone on to the other world. And you did this every year. You did it every time there was a funeral in the family as well. Offering sacrifices to the dead who are revered now as some kind of gods. Now, how does that help us to understand Revelation 2 and the letter to Pergamum? Well, it might not be that they're just eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols. It seems that they are actually engaging in some kind of idolatry here. And we're told also that they commit acts of immorality, acts of fornication. Is that literal or figurative here? It's hard to say. But the whole picture is that there is an involvement in idolatry, in paganism, that can be called fornication of some kind, just like it was back in the day of Balaam. And I think you could probably make a strong case that whoever this Balaam person is in Pergamum, that he may well have been encouraging Christians to participate in the emperor cult. Because remember... Except for people like uh, Nero and Domitian, the deified emperors are dead people. You go to the emperor's temple after he's dead and worship him. And it may very well be that this compromise that's going on here is a compromise in the emperor cult. That there's somebody in the church saying, you know what, I don't think it's all that much of a problem. What's the big deal? We go down and pay homage to the emperor. We do it, it's done, we go on about our business, we live our lives as Christians. And the Lord says, i got a problem with that. Because remember the inscription we saw just a moment ago, these men are being called Almighty, Lord of the earth and of the sea, Son of God. And the Lord says, i got a problem with you doing that. 
Now, it's hard to nail that down specifically, but it certainly sounds like that. Somebody have their hand up over here? Uh, any questions about that, uh, that point there or that thought? Well, there's something else interesting about this. Uh, the Lord says um, in uh, verse 16, Repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. According to Joshua 13.22, when the Israelites invaded the land, they killed Balaam with the sword. So this imagery continues, this idea of compromising with the pagans. And uh, also in this context, the Roman governor of the area, by Roman law, had the right of the sword, the right of capital punishment. The Lord has already said, Antipas, Antipas, my faithful witness, has already been executed. And again, it's hard to know exactly what's going on, but it certainly sounds like maybe the Romans have, have put him to death. And so the Lord says, I'm going to use my sword too. They use the sword, I can use a sword. And mine's far more deadly than theirs. The Lord says, he who has an ear, let him hear. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. That's one of the most mysterious images in all the book of Revelation, I'll tell you right now, because there's not another reference in all the Bible to hidden manna. But there is one thing that does seem to be suggestive of that. You think of manna, of course you think of the wilderness, but there was something else in the Old Testament associated with manna. Anybody remember what that was? Not just living out in the wilderness, but there was some manna someplace else. In the Ark of the Covenant, there was a golden pot of manna kept in there. It was hidden. Nobody could ever go in there and look at it or see it or do anything. It was in the Ark. And the only time anybody's ever going to be around the Ark is when they are in the Holy of Holies. And the only time you would ever seen the, the hidden the, the, the manna there was if you actually could have looked inside that. It was the most secretive place in all of Israel, as it were. And that seems to be the idea here that the Lord is saying that I will bring you to the closest possible place with me. Just like the manna that was in the Ark of the Covenant that nobody could, you had to be extremely close to me to get to there. But the Lord says, if you'll overcome, I'll bring you that close to me. And he also says that I will give him a white stone. I don't know what the white stone is. I'm going to tell you right now. It could be a reference to the Emperor called some kind of stone or maybe a, a little piece of uh, like a, a chip that was given to people to prove that they had sacrificed to the emperor. There's been some suggestion about that and that the Lord is saying, you stay faithful to me, I'll give you a white stone too, on which no one, uh, with, the, with a name written on which no one knows but he who receives it. In other words, that will contain who you really are written on it. Is that what it means? Who knows? Hard to kind of get into some of these details, but the, the picture is clear enough that the Lord is speaking to them in language that they would have recognized to say, I'm going to reward you for your faithfulness tremendously in a way that the world never could, but I want you to be careful of your compromise. Uh, any thoughts here about Pergamum or anything that is written in that letter here? Questions or comments? All right, then, let's look at a third letter, the message to Thyatira. Thyatira was famous for its dyeing, not people dyeing, but dyeing fabric, and trade in the color of indigo. There is a root that grows in that part of the world that is still grown there. Uh, if you buy anything from Europe that is called Turkish red, it is made from the same color that was used here in ancient Thyatira. It also had several textile-related trade guilds. Uh, in the inscriptions that have been left in the city, we read about people who dyed wool, about people who uh, made cotton clothing, garment manufacturing, leather workers. So there was a, a very healthy uh, garment industry, as well as goldsmiths, coppersmiths, people like that. And one thing that we maybe don't always realize is that, let's say you are a, a wool uh, weaver, that you 
weave wool into clothing or into uh, material. Well, you would have had kind of a union, the way auto workers have a union today, called a trade guild. And these trade guilds were usually associated with some god. And you would be expected to honor that god to bring success to your work. And these, of course, would have been a source of opposition to Christians as well, Christians who won't worship these gods and therefore put the city's business in jeopardy. There's not much to see at Thyatira, kind of like at Smyrna. There's about a one-square-block area where there's a bunch of ruins sticking up out of the ground, but you can see that they are in horrible shape and uh, not much uh, to see there. There is an interesting inscription still sitting on the ground over there, and this is from the time of Domitian. And the reason we know it's from the time of Domitian is because of this right here. You can see that something has been chiseled off of that inscription. And we know from several sources that after Domitian died that the order was given to remove his name from every public place that had ever been written. And when you see these inscriptions sitting around in ancient sites, it's Domitian. So this inscription is an inscription from the time of Domitian. Um, I'm still trying to find this Greek word in a dictionary. I think it means something like people who work with wool. Um, but anyway, the inscription identifies him as one who is over all the inhabited world, using a term that the early Christians again would have used of God. So you can see in Thyatira there would have been challenges as well. The Lord says uh, in verse 19, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service and your perseverance that your deeds have laid are greater than, are, than at first. So kind of like Pergamum, you've been good and, and that is commendable, but verse 20, I've got a problem with you too, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Probably like the name Balaam, Jezebel is probably here a figurative name, probably not the woman's real name. But she calls herself a prophetess. Now remember in the Old Testament, Jezebel is the wife of Ahab, and she was not an Israelite. She was a Phoenician princess. It was Ahab's father's great idea to marry his son to a Phoenician for business purposes. Dumbest thing he ever did, right? But that's what he did. And through Ahab comes Baal worship. Somebody please go to 1 Kings 21, 25 and read that passage for us. 1 Kings 21, 25. Who has that? You have that claim? Surely there was no, no one like Ahab and sold himself to the devil in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. Sold himself to the devil because of his wife. You certainly get a sense of that here as well, that she is selling this church to the devil. She calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and leads my bond servant as servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Again, probably, possibly a reference to involvement in the emperor cult. The fact that she's called Jezebel may suggest that she is a member of the church. Not somebody from outside, but like Jezebel was married to Ahab, that this woman would have maybe have been an insider. And that she calls herself a prophetess. Now we know from Paul's writings that there were prophetesses in the early church. We know that from the book of Acts as well. Philip had daughters who prophesied. And so she's apparently passing herself off as a prophet, a Christian prophet within the church at Thyatira. But the Lord says she's not a real prophet. She's not one of my prophets because what she is doing is teaching my people to do the very thing I don't want them to do. And that is to get involved in this idolatry and this fornication. Now again, the fornication may be figurative there, not literal sexual immorality, but... Um, uh, the immorality of not being faithful to God. But it seems that she may have been a pagan prophetess who was a member of the church and from within trying to lead them astray. The Lord says, I gave her time to repent, 
Behold, I'm going to throw her on a bed of sickness. I will kill her children. To the rest of you who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what, what you have, hold fast until I come. Is that the second bell that is rung? Okay. We're done for this evening. Then we will pick up with Sardis uh, the next time we meet and try to look at Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Thanks for your good attention, as always.